Good morning, everybody. If we could take your seats, please. We're going to get going. This is a wonderful turnout for 8.30 in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you had a good day yesterday. Um, my name is Michael Clausen. I'm a vice president at uh, Save the Children, oversee the policy work and humanitarian response work. And I want to echo Carolyn's welcome yesterday to everybody to our 2014 Advocacy Summit. Um, many of you are with us yesterday. Some of you are just joining us today. And so thank you for coming. Um, and a special thank you. Some people are coming just in from the suburbs in Washington, so it's a fairly short ride. Others are coming from hundreds, if not thousands, of miles away. And we have people here from Alaska. <laughs> you All right. <laughs> from Texas. I'm not going to call. <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. We can spend all morning on the states. Um, we've got 30 states here, so I'm, I'm going to stop it when I'm quit while I'm ahead with Texas and Alaska. But there's also Florida, New Jersey, and a number of others. And so thank, it's a wonderful, wonderful turnout. And what I'm really impressed with is, is the number of young people in this room. I mean, it's really terrific that you're here today with us. And I think when you, know, when you heard, listened to some of the speakers yesterday, they really underscored the importance of what you're going to be doing on Capitol Hill this afternoon. Um, and what, what I can say from previous advocacy summits, it's really the young people that get the attention when we go to these meetings. This is not something a lot of members of Congress expect. They expect folks like me who, to come in and sort of, you know, tired old government relations types. Uh, but in fact, when it's young people coming in and talking about issues of concern that they have for, for children elsewhere and for young people elsewhere, people, you know, perk up and listen. So, I mean, it's really important what, you, that, what you're doing here today. So I think we're all here because we have a common commitment to ensure that every child has a strong start in life. And I think there's also a common sense in the room that together, by doing this work that we're gonna be doing today in Washington, we can help secure that strong start for children, both here in America, but also for children around the world. And I think our advocacy summit itself got a strong start yesterday. I mean, I think there's a terrific uh, future generations, future leaders workshop in the morning and a lot of skills that were developed in that workshop and the, the young people that participated, some 60 of them, will have a chance to show those skills in the meetings this afternoon uh, on Capitol Hill, including elevator speeches. So they learned how to do elevator speeches. Um, and then you've also heard from a lot of experts on the challenges that, um, that children um, have to face in order for us to help ensure a healthy start for them, uh, to have, ensure that they have an opportunity to learn and, and to ensure that they're protected from harm. Um, and people like Bridget Mendler had a terrific, moderated a terrific panel with youth advocates. Uh, Andrea Mitchell had a terrific panel with uh, people from the Romney campaign and Obama campaign. And then certainly the Secretary of uh, Education spoke to us and a number of members of Congress. And I think my takeaway from all that really was, and, and a constant theme in all those messages, really was this is a huge opportunity for all of us to bring about change for children. It's a huge opportunity. No matter what you've heard about the political gridlock and all the rest in Washington, coming together like we've done, we're doing today is a dramatic and huge opportunity to make a difference for kids. And it's really important. That was the other theme I think every single speaker underscored. The work that each and every one of us is doing today here in Washington is, is really important. So what I'd like to do um, is, is show a, a few highlights from the, the summit yesterday. We've got a short little video that was put together overnight and and I want to show some highlights from the from the uh, program yesterday especially for those who didn't participate but as a little reminder for those that did so if we could roll the video please welcome to 2014 advocacy summit
keep striving for the best, do your best, and succeed. And giving some real life examples of what's happening back home, I think, are, is critical. I think it was a great, great start, um, and today is another big day. It's the day that we take the messages that we've been developing up to Capitol Hill and, and impress on Congress the importance of investing in kids. So I hope you're all energized. I hope you're all excited. I hope you're all wearing comfortable shoes. Um, and if I were a drill sergeant, I would say, are you ready to take the hill? No, 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 no. You, that, that was pretty anemic. I'm, you're going to have to get down and give me 10. Are you ready to take the hill? Yeah. Okay. That's better. That's loud and clear, and that's the way we want to do it, so that Congress will listen. So as Carolyn said on this clip, I mean, it's, it's really, there's a lot of children out there who are facing real challenges, and they can't speak up on Capitol Hill. And it's really our task um, to speak up for those kids in America and for those kids um, around the world. And, you know, it, people... Politicians really don't pay attention to a lot of children's issues, in part because the children can't vote. But a lot of folks in this room are constituents of the members we're going to be seeing. You do vote, um, and they will listen to, to constituents. So it's important that we use our, our voices in that fashion. You know, 55 years ago today, April 9th, 1959, NASA announced the seven first astronauts that were going to staff the Mercury capsule program. And they were, quickly be called, they were quickly called the Mercury 7. I think, you know, given the journey that we're going to be going on today and the importance of that journey, I think we should be called the Awesome Save the Children 300. Okay? So we can be the Awesome Save the Children 300. So what, what I want to do is just touch very briefly on the two issues that we'll be taking up to, to the Hill, and we'll have some time in, in a little bit later this morning to go through them in more detail. But the first issue is on international... Uh, newborn and child survival, and then the second is on early childhood education, particularly for kids in, in America. So in the case of newborn child survival, there's 18,000 children around the world that will die today and every day for the rest of the year of causes that are largely treatable and preventable. It's things like complication at birth, it's things like pneumonia, it's things like diarrhea, it's things like malaria. And those are not things that kill kids here in the United States, but they're killing lots of kids overseas. 18,000 kids a day is over 6 million children in a year. 1 million children die on the day they're born. That's not acceptable. And we can, one, of, one of the things we can do is help make a, make a change to that. I think what we can do is imagine and also fight this afternoon for a better world for, for kids so that this does not have to happen. And Save the Children has been running a global campaign, both here in America and in scores of countries around the world where we work, to try to put this issue in front of policymakers and to say that the world knows how to deal with this and that we have known solutions and we can bring about dramatic reductions and we can end preventable child deaths. We've got health and nutrition programs that are in the business of delivering both the uh, solutions that kids need and, and moms need so this is no longer the case. Um, and also bringing about innovations that others c can adopt. So our, our advocacy here in Washington literally can save lives. That's what this is all about. Um, and it's about generating the political will. It's about generating the necessary funding so known solutions can be rolled out by us, by national governments, by everybody. And I think we're bringing our voices together to really give that a big push. So. Huge progress has been made if you look back over the last 20 years, the, the number of children that are dying of preventable and treatable causes is, is going down, but 6.6 .6 million is still way too much. So we have a lot of work still to do, 
and really it's about bringing members attention to this issue because they don't there's a lot of things they're paying attention to this is often doesn't break through so let me t you know if you think about sort of what is it what does it mean to have um, access to affordable health care for kids overseas for basic health care overseas so that that we can end this large number of children that are dying of preventable and treatable causes we've got another short little clip that we can um, run that'll address this for you so if we could run the second video please So that, that's, that's essentially the message that you'll have an opportunity to take to members of Congress. And I think the, the better they understand it, um, the more U.S. leadership will see in drawing world attention to this problem, and the quicker we'll be able to reduce the number of children that are dying of preventable um, and treatable causes. So let me switch to the early childhood education, which we heard a lot about um, yesterday. I mean, today in America, there's 16 million children uh, that are living in poverty. And I think, as you heard from Secretary Duncan, and also Congressman Hanna, education is the way to break that cycle of poverty. It's really the best way to give kids uh, a better chance to succeed in life. And the challenge is that so many children, um, w when they come to school, uh, they're not ready for school. And, that, and that's, that, that's the issue that we're focusing on today. Um, it, it's often the case, particularly for children who are less advantaged and, and from lower income families, it's often the case that by the, by the time they're four years old, there may be 12 to 18 months developmentally behind their better off peers. So imagine that, imagine being so far behind your four, uh, by your fourth birthday that when you start um, kindergarten, it's always already a struggle to keep up. I mean, that's amazing. And that's, I think, what Secretary Duncan was pointing out yesterday. And then what that, what that does, it compounds the, the, the gap so that by the time kids are in fourth grade, it's almost impossible then to, to catch up. So the, the whole point of, the, of this early um, childhood education is to invest in the in the earlier years, so every child has a fair start and can can get you know take advantage of the early childhood education and be in kindergarten and keep up with the peers. And so we're going to share with you uh, one more video that highlights the importance of this issue. And it's actually was um, prepared by our newest board member and artist ambassador Jennifer Gardner. She's really passionate about this issue, and so she created this video herself. Uh, and produced it herself, and I want to share it with you today. So if we could run this last video as well. It's hard to imagine, but just two hours from where I live in Los Angeles is one of the poorest areas in America, California's Central Valley.
This is not an isolated issue. From the mountains of Kentucky to Central Valley, 16 million children live in poverty in the United States. For a family of four, that means living on less than $24,000 a year. Early education provides the best way out. But more than 60% of families don't even have books in their homes. Learning begins at birth, and a child's brain is already 90% developed by the age of five. Statistically, children who grow up in poverty are 18 months behind at four years old. Often, they don't catch up. Luckily, Save the Children has people on the ground in the Central Valley like Virginia. Tipton is a small community of 1,300 people. The works here are farming, milking. Uh, we do have Nancy, drugs, gangs are our biggest obstacle. I joined Virginia on her first home visit of the day to meet with Dahlia and her 18-month-old son, Joseph. Thank you so much for having me. No, you for being here. Of course. <laughs> Hi, Joseph. Virginia visits the family to check Joseph's progress. What would you say something different that you're noticing in Joseph? Well, that he, he's playing more. And show Dahlia how to talk with him and play with him. With each visit, Virginia brings a new batch of books and activities to help Joseph learn and grow. And then we... I saw it. <laughs> With her husband working long hours in the fields and the nearest neighbor miles away, Dahlia and Joseph are isolated. Can I read this to you, buddy? Virginia's regular visits are a lifeline for the family. Take the lead and speed up. He really wants to learn. He's yeah. Really... I even tell him, you know, teacher's coming, and he runs the door to open wow. it. This is a mom who really wants her son to succeed. She really wants him to go to school. She wants him to thrive at school. As a child, I never had a book because my parents were busy working, and mm -hmm. so it was do it on your own. Mm -hmm. That's why I, you know, I try to encourage them to read more. Over the next few years, Dahlia will learn about everything from the importance of reading and establishing healthy sleep routines to helping Joseph develop socially and emotionally. And by the time he reaches kindergarten, Joseph will be ready for success. She is grabbing onto everything Save the Children is giving her and running with it. After my morning with Dahlia and Joseph, I traveled 19 miles to the town of Plainview to meet another home visitor, Diana. We dropped in on 19-year-old Rosa and her daughter, Serena. Hi. Hi. At the home Hi. she shares with seven other family members. You, Missy. Nine months ago, Rosa went into labor and was taken 60 miles to the nearest hospital where she gave birth to her daughter three months premature. Serena weighed only one pound. They brought her and like, she was so tiny. Like she had her eyes closed when they brought it to me, and like all of a sudden she just opened them. And you have beautiful eyes. And she eyes. looked at me like straight to my eyes. Wow. Days later, she was discharged and sent home while her daughter stayed in intensive care. Like for me, it was like terrible. To leave your like, baby, I can't I even can't imagine, imagine for three months. She didn't know what to do. She had to leave her baby. Her heart was broken. And at that time, she met Diana from Save the Children. Just when Rosa needed help the most, Save the Children was there. First, arranging transportation to the hospital so she could bond with Serena during that critical time then providing books, toys, and guidance to help Rosa and her baby thrive. Teacher Deanna, like, she's helped me a lot. I like to play with my daughter, you know, and that's what helped me with my daughter because she wouldn't do, like, stuff that she does mm -hmm. now. And you can see this mom is, is on her way. With Diana visiting her every week, you know that she will be there encouraging her and saying, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> okay, okay. We're really lucky to have someone like Diana working for Save the Children. Save the Children's Early Childhood Program serves thousands of moms like Rosa and Dahlia all over the country. Where does Daddy work, Maya? Daddy's working the cows. Giving children the opportunity to learn and grow and helping them get a fair shot at a bright future. Well, I'm going home. I like for my kids to get out of here someday where they can further their education, you know, and make some other sales. The program's changed our life. I'm not running from it made me realize how smart he really is. I don't regret this life I chose for me. But these places and these faces are getting old. So
I want my kid to be something, a doctor, a surgeon, a, something special that helps people. Even if he could be president, that'd be cool. So we're all here in Washington, but the, you've seen the real people on these two videos that are the, were the ones that were really trying to help move forward. Um, I think you know everyone says America is the land of opportunity, and I think the early childhood um, education initiative is something that actually can put that opportunity in the hands of every child. It's really a, sort of an early um, hand up for, for every child to have a strong start in life. And that's, that's the message we're going to be taking to the Hill. So we've got a, you know, the, the, the awesome Save the Children 300 is a really strong 300 folks, a third of whom roughly are, are young people. So that, as I was saying, those are the, the ones that actually congressmen and, and senators will really be interested in uh, hearing from. And our, the team has organized about 150 meetings, give or take, on the Hill. So you're all set up by teams here in this room, and each team will roughly have three meetings. Um, I think this, we're, we're doing this work here in Washington, but there's actually a virtual summit going on at the same time. Um, and I know some of you are probably a lot more adept with these kinds of things than I am. Um, but there's a little packet in your, a little page in your, in your packet that talks about tweeting and, and Facebook and all the rest. So there's, there's a hashtag save kids. Uh, and you can probably involve a lot of your friends and families from all across the country. So when we go up on the hill this afternoon, it's not only us meeting directly with members and staff, but it's also from people all over the country weighing in um, through, through, um, you know, through social media and through sending letters and making phone calls. So I would encourage you, and probably have a little more information shortly, um, to, to take advantage of that. So we have both the actual summary, is a summit, the brick and mortar summit here, uh, but also, but also the, the virtual one. So we can really fill the halls of Congress with physical voices and virtual voices. Now, I know that going to the Hill sometimes can be a bit intimidating, so I'm wondering, for how many people, if you could raise your hands, this is your first time? Who's, for how many? Okay, so it's actually, that's, that's not bad. So, don't be afraid. Those who have done it before, raise your hand. Okay, so there's a, there's a larger number of people who have done it before. So the point I want to make to those who haven't, our rookies, um, is that, that advocacy is very much a team sport. You're all seated by teams. Each team has a leader, and then from the show of hands of those who have done this before, each team will have a lot of other people that have experience. So we're going to spend part of this morning uh, getting folks ready, and we'll have an opportunity to, to go into the issues in, in a little bit more depth and actually to role play uh, and practice a bit before you're up on the hill um, in the afternoon. So we, we have no intention of sending people uh, unprepared up on the hill, but you're in very good hands with your team leader, and you're in very good hands with others on the team who have, who have done this before. And I would, the other point I would make is we hope this is very much not just a one-day uh, experience for you because, as you'll hear, advocacy, um, and particularly with the Congress, is, is not about coming to Washington once a year, delivering a message, and then saying, mission accomplished. Um, advocacy is very much about building a relationship. And so when you are going back home, uh, we, we really look forward to staying in touch and working with you and seeing how we can together uh, advance this agenda that brought us all, all to Washington. So with that, uh, we, we have a wonderful panel coming up, which I, I would like to introduce. It's about building a, a global moment, a movement. And um, let me introduce again uh, Carolyn Miles, who's the president and CEO of Save the Children. And she set the bar very, very high for breakthroughs um, that, in, that we're trying to achieve in the way the world treats children. I said earlier that some of us came from a couple of miles in the suburbs of Washington, or even several thousand miles from Alaska. Uh, but Carolyn, since the beginning of 2013 through now, has traveled 199,201 miles for children. And that's determination and that's commitment. So, Carolyn. <laughs> well, thank you. And I, I just want to thank uh, Michael and his team. He might be a government relations guy. Um, but I have to tell you that he and his team members are extremely well respected here in this town. And you wouldn't be getting 150 meetings up on the hill today if it were not for Michael and his team and the respect that they have here in this city. So thank you, Michael. And I didn't actually know how many miles I'd traveled. That's actually not, I'm not sure I want to know that. But, but what I can tell you is that 
the kids that I meet, so I meet thousands of children in the visits that I do to our programs around the world, and every single one of those kids deserves to live and to survive and to thrive. And that is what we are here to do. We are here, again, to give voice to those children that we're all serving all around the world. So I can tell you it makes a huge difference. And we're going to talk a little bit today, we're going to have a great panel to talk about how we build a movement. Because you're not done after you leave here today. We know who you are, we know where you live. And we are going to engage you in this idea of building a movement, a movement of children in this country who care about kids. We all say we care about kids. You heard Arnie Duncan say yesterday, those of you who are, who are here, who's against education? Who's against children? No one. But at the end of the day, we really have to keep people accountable for standing up for kids, all of us, and, and really engaging many more, and keeping our politicians and our elected officials accountable for kids as well. So that's really a lot of what today is about. So as Michael mentioned, um, we want to again welcome our live stream audience uh, that's out there, our virtual audience, which is thousands of other people who are watching this live stream, and we want to engage them in using the hashtag hash save kids and all of you as well. So don't forget about tweeting and, and doing all of the Instagrams and everything else that will keep this alive. You know, this is really important because the members of Congress actually and their staff really do pay attention to social media. So they are watching what's happening in this room and listening to the voices in this room even before we get there. So let's, let's let them know we're coming and, uh, and give them some warning. So the panel that we're going to talk about today, uh, this morning, is, is really a, a great group of individuals. And they have each started, in different ways, social movements of their own. So we're going to talk about how they did that and um, have some examples that they're going to share with us. So I want to bring them out today. Um, so if the panelists can come out and join us, and then I will sit and we'll, we'll introduce them. Thank you. All right, let's see, the mic's on? Yeah, okay, terrific. So let me uh, first introduce you to our panelists and then we're gonna, we're gonna jump right in. So to my left is Chris Temple. And Chris is a filmmaker and he has made a film called Living on a Dollar a Day and also founded an organization uh, of the same name. And so Chris is gonna talk to us about how do we use film to actually bring to life a social movement. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. Yep. And next to Chris is Ann Mara Conley. And Ann Mara is the Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President of City Year Inc. And again, another kind of social movement that's been uh, developed here in the United States. And she's gonna talk about her work and, and how, that's, how that's gone in developing a movement. So I think uh, we'll start, I think you guys are going to introduce your organizations a little bit. And we have some videos, again, more videos, uh, to try to do that. So we'll start actually with Ann Mara's video. Um, and you might want to say a couple of words before we run it, and then we'll, we'll go with that. Thanks, Carolyn, and thanks for having me. It's great to be uh, here with all of you today. And I was standing backstage listening to Michael, and I wanted to um, do the wave back there because as somebody who has been working on movement building for a long time the idea of showing up and being present on the hill um, as well as through social media which we'll talk a little bit about um, in a few minutes is so important and it is not a one-shot deal it is a it is a, a commitment you have to make to kind of stick with it um, so as Carolyn mentioned I'm the chief strategy officer of city year I'm also the president of an organization called voices for national service which actually is a coalition of all of the service organizations in this country who have been working together for a number of years to, um, to, uh, to try to engage the country in a conversation about um, national service and a year of service being a common expectation for every person in this country and particularly every young person in this country. And we have been um, sort of a lean, mean, uh, ragtag bunch, but we have uh, been working together now for about 10 years uh, to really try to move this idea that um, the country should be investing in young people, giving them an opportunity to really step up and lead. 
And so the video that you're about to see is one that we, uh, it's, it's actually a compilation video of a contest we did last year, um, actually at the urging of Senator Harkin. And so uh, with that, I guess we'll roll the video and then we can talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. Hello, I'm Senator Tom Harkin from the state of Iowa. My friends, the future of national service is at risk. AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, VISTA, NCCC. The House says these programs are unnecessary. They simply fail to see the vital work you do to serve our communities. I'm asking you to join me in telling members of Congress why you serve. And here's how it's done. Pick up your recording device, speak from the heart. Hi, I'm Senator Tom Harkin from Iowa, and I serve because I believe passionately in creating a ladder of opportunity for all of our citizens, because I want to create a better, fairer, richer America for everyone. Now it's your turn. I serve. I serve. I serve. I serve. I serve. I serve because it's my responsibility to serve, and I believe that my service can bring about the service of others. I serve because growing up in Inglewood, I saw a lot of issues with our community. I serve because service is an economical, effective, and empowering way to address community needs. And I serve because I love my community and I want to make it better for all of us. I serve because I saw a need to help men and women returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. I have a student who yesterday called me to let me know that she won a full ride scholarship to the University of Houston for $88,000. And she is the reason that I serve for, to help students like this. So make no mistake, the future of national service depends on your voices being heard. So we'll come back and ask a couple of specific questions, Anmar, about how that Voices for Service is, how that campaign got started and how it's going. Um, let me turn now to Chris and um, his work, as I said, as a, as a filmmaker, and he's using film to really drive a social movement. So I think we're going to have another video, but you might want to say a word or two. Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And to jumpstart the morning, I know it's at least early for me, uh, we'll start with a film trailer. So movie trailers are, are a great way to kick off. But a little context. So this is uh, this journey for me really started actually as a sophomore in college. Um, and at the time, I was studying economics, was studying international relations. And uh, we designed a plan to go, a friend of mine and I, in a dorm room, designed a plan to go live on a dollar a day ourselves in a rural village in Guatemala. And the idea was to try to go beyond the textbook. How do you understand how someone really survives at that level, what they're going through, what the issues truly are? So it started as just a, a two-month summer vacation. <laughs> vacation. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse into, into the film here with the trailer. So let's roll that. Some really good Wi Fi here. <laughs> Are you filming? Filming, filming. I've read about poverty. My <laughs> Gonna give it one more try. Yeah. We've challenged our tech folks this morning, many videos in a row. Can you use the downloaded version? My whole life in media, in school. Sweating like crazy. I think you're sweating because of the heat or your nerves? I'm nerv nervous. <laughs> What is it really like to live every day and only having one dollar to spend? Okay, have water. Hey, we have a water source. <laughs> uh, it takes like five. Five 
five hours to cook beans and they're still uh, very hard, so that sucks. Thirty-six hundred calories split amongst four people is not good enough for our daily value. We all have these pugas. I can't sleep another night like this. It's not due to laziness that someone is poor. It's not due to a lack of ambition or a lack of intelligence. It's because they lack things that we take advantage of every day. There is no going back now. Let's get out, let's get out, let's get out. That was highly illegal. ¿Por qué quieres aprender español? Puede encontrar un trabajo. Seems like this happens like once a day. This life is incredibly, incredibly hard. What can I do? Each individual can affect and help a single other individual. We can change the world. So hopefully that got you excited about uh, Chris's next film, which is about how to live as a refugee, which he'll talk about. Um, let me turn now to our third guest, Joshua. And Joshua Dubois uh, is here with us, and he is the former special assistant to President Obama and the former executive director of Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships from the White House. So it's great to have Josh with us, and he's going to talk about government and government's role in building so social movements. So, Josh, I know you don't have a video. It's okay. I can you act can act something, something out if you'd like to. <laughs> Feel free. dance. Exactly. But, um, but why don't you just give us a little bit of sure. introduction uh, of what you've been up to, Absolutely. and um, we'll go from there. Well, good morning, everyone. First, it's wonderful to be here with you, and thank you for the tremendous work you're doing around the world and around this country as well to make sure people can live lives of dignity and self-determination. Um, it's an honor to be here with you. So for years, I, I worked um, with President Obama back uh, dating to the time he was a senator. And most recently, I led the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And our job was to mobilize faith communities um, to address poverty and lack of opportunity, both in this country and around the world, really rooted in the simple idea that people of faith and communities of faith have been engines for change across our nation's history. If you look at the progressive movement and the women's rights movement and certainly the civil rights movement and other movements for change, at the heart of those movements were often communities of faith. And so we sought to um, get them in the game in terms of changing the world around them today. We did that on a number of issues, from human trafficking to um, helping faith-based organizations set up job training programs to working with religious leaders around the globe on, on uh, poverty and development issues. And, um, and I, th I think we'll get into some of those specific stories later, but that's basically what we did is mobilize communities of faith. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. So we're going to start with, um, so I'll, we'll start with kind of an easy question. We'll get harder as we go. Um, but let's start with some examples of successes. I'm going to ask each of you to talk about a, a specific success you had and, and how did mobilizing the American public play into that success? So, Anne Mara, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks. Um, so we've had, uh, as every movement that I know of and, and have read about, uh, we've had our ups and downs over the course of the years. And back in 2003, um, that's sort of when this movement really crystallized. I've actually been working on this idea. I was a Jesuit volunteer, faith-based oh, service. Oh, wonderful. Jesus. Back in the day. Um, and was really a life-changing event for me and a life-changing experience. And I, I'm, I'm from this area. I moved back to Washington. And I discovered there's this whole um, grassroots effort um, around the country uh, trying to work together to encourage the federal government to invest in this idea of national service. And so I was all fired up because I thought, wow, you know, I, this has been such an incredible experience for me. And the fact that all these folks from around the country who are on the ground doing great work are working together to try to make this happen um, is pretty compelling. And so I dove in and I've been working now in this field for more than 25 years. Um, hard to imagine, but true. Uh, and so, um, so you know, we were pretty successful. We, we worked together with the Clinton administration, got the AmeriCorps legislation written and passed, and 
um, that really was the, the effort of a lot of folks like you who were on the ground and knew what the realities were and the fact that we needed more low-cost human capital to try to really address the issues facing our communities. So that was all good and everybody's all fired up. We launched AmeriCorps on the White House lawn. Um, folks started signing up in droves and then fast forward a few years to 2003 um, as a result of a bunch of different, it was sort of a perfect storm of some um, bureaucratic issues, lack of understanding on the Hill and a, a couple of other factors. Uh, AmeriCorps was facing cuts of about 80%. Um, now this is, had been around for since 1994, um, doing great work in communities. A lot of organizations had come to depend on the talent and the idealism and the energy of the young people who, and, and not so young people, but mostly young people who were serving. Um, and so when they started to face these devastating cuts, I think we as a community realized it's not enough to show up once a year and wave the flag. We actually have to figure out how to be a more regular voice here in Washington um, and also back in our communities to try to engage members of Congress and other decision makers in our work so that they really had a firsthand um, understanding of what this resource meant for the country. And we like to say that National Service is an experiential brand. It's not something that really translates as effectively on paper as it does when you actually are engaging people in in the work that you're doing. So we, a um, bunch of us got together and, and got on the phone. We had no organized you know, effort, no organization. We got on the phone every night at 10 o'clock and we'd decide what to do the next day. And it literally was that sort of ragtag, um, make it up as you go, kind of organic. Um, and, but we began to build some real momentum and um, we, you know, we decided every day, okay, what's tomorrow's goal? And so we launched an effort to try to get the media to engage. We ended up getting 79 editorials around the country and over 140 op-eds um, in a very short time span of a couple of weeks. Um, we organized a citizen's hearing uh, here in Washington. We decided if, if members of Congress are going to have hearings, then citizens should be able to show up and have their own hearing. And so we did 100 hours of consecutive citizen testimony on the hill, um, literally through the night, 100 straight hours, lots of pizza, lots of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, it was really amazing. And we got the attention of folks on the hill because that had not been, actually the Peace Corps had done something similar several years before, but that had not been done before. And we had people coming in on planes and trains and buses from Alaska and California and Nevada and, and you know the, the South, all over the country, um, and telling their stories of what their service meant to them and what it meant to the communities that they were serving. And it really, um, it really did get people's attention. In fact, we had a number of members of Congress, we would literally go to, go to their office and ask them to come down and just watch. Just come for 10 minutes and listen. And we tried to actually go and, and get people when the folks from their communities were, were testifying. Um, and we had a number of members come and actually sit through testimony um, and then go back and tell their staff they had to come and listen. And they weren't just Democrats, they were also Republicans. And I think they were really compelled by the stories of the folks that they represented, um, bringing those stories to DC and telling them in a, very, um, in a very personal way. And I think that was very compelling. And so we actually did not end up getting the cut reinstated that year, but the following year we got the highest um, investment by the federal government in national service in the history of the program and actually the highest investment to date uh, was the, the, the year following our efforts. Um, and so that was sort of the beginning of Voices for National Service and we realized we needed to have a more regular presence here um, and we needed to really engage folks in creative ways um, in sharing our message and sharing their stories. Great. So the power of personal stories, I mean, I think that's a great example. So Chris, let me turn to you and, and talk to us about a success and, and how mobilizing uh, people was a Yeah, of and I, you know, I think I'll start with a success that happened even before we were an organization. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we were just, this idea for this film and that you saw the trailer to today was born while we were in college. And we actually left uh, for Guatemala not thinking we were gonna make a film, surprisingly enough. So it was really just a way to spend a summer doing something meaningful. It was supposed to be a two-month project, uh, and we brought along two cameras with us, uh, two little you know, Canon DSLR cameras, and we were gonna upload videos to YouTube while we were there, so people could follow along on this journey, you know, friends and family. Uh, it was one of the only ways I could convince my mom to let me go was I'll be blogging, <laughs> don't worry, uh, you'll get to be a part of this. Uh, and then when we got there, we, you know, we uploaded our first YouTube video and the video got uh, about 600,000 views. Um, and we just uploaded this video to YouTube and it was, it was terrible to honestly, I watched it now and it was not a particularly good video, but what it, what it showed me was 
people wanted to be, I think our generation especially, wanted to be a part of, a, of an active movement, wanted to be a part of something like this. And it was really, it was shared virally on, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on a, on a number of different platforms. And in a lot of ways, it was the momentum that Americans and a lot of others around the world, they inspired us to not only survive the, the two months while there and, and, you know, and uh, complete the journey, but also to then film so we could create that feature-length documentary. That's great. Great. So your audience was really the ones that compelled you to start the movement that you've started. Great story. Josh. Sure. Well, a, a few examples. Uh, one is our campaign to organize faith communities to respond to the issue of human trafficking, both here in this country and around the world. Um, the, the, the reality is we still have slavery today. There are folks um, both in the United States and a number of countries around the world who are either uh, sex slaves or labor slaves. They're forced to do things that they don't um, want to do and, and, um, and in pretty horrific conditions. But we noticed that the faith community wasn't really a significant part of the response to that issue. Um, these are tough problems dealing with very tough subjects and they hadn't really been brought to the table. So we decided to see if we could bring them to the table, um, really using their own holy scriptures. We looked back at um, all the different religious traditions, Christians and Muslims and, and, and Jews and Hindus and um, other traditions as well, and tried to find those, um, those, those scriptures that spoke about slavery, that spoke about re uh, freeing people from bondage and, um, and convened conversations, theological conversations about uh, what that meant and why that might compel action today. So we got folks to the White House, and before you knew it, after a series of meetings through our presidential advisory council, we had major denominations uh, agreeing to launch new human trafficking programs um, because of, of, of that work. And you know, calls to the trafficking hotline have gone up, and um, this is you know, this cross-pollinated with a number of different organizations. United Way decided to launch a trafficking initiative because of, of this work, and so it was really, interestingly enough, um, connecting into to scripture and moral values, um, but from diverse perspectives. Oh. That's, That's intense. fascinating. <laughs> That's one example. Not sure what that um, means, the uh, dimming uh, of the lights. Uh, another small one is, uh, well, not small, but an important one is our work around job clubs. Um, uh, in 2009, 2010, obviously we were in a very tough um, economic environment, and we decided, um, we were hearing from people that job training wasn't enough um, for folks who were dealing with unemployment. They also needed sort of kind of emotional support to get through that tough time, and so we started some pilots at a few congregations around the country, uh, around 10 of them at first, um, uh, helping congregations set up uh, places for unemployed folks to come and just talk about what they're going through and um, not uh, and work on their resumes, connect to employers, but also connect with one another and receive that sort of support. Um, next thing you knew, uh, people started hearing about this and they wanted their church to start it or their synagogue or temple. And um, at the end of a two-year period, we'd have 4,000 job clubs around the country because of, of, of that work. So a couple examples there. Yeah. Great, great examples of, of, and also about how you kind of meet people where they are exactly. and help yeah. them use the tools that, that that they have and are, are, are familiar with. Absolutely. So, great example. So let's turn to, um, to creativity and talk a little bit about creativity. And this time I'll start with you, Josh. You, you're each using different, and I heard some different examples of how you've been creative with your approaches and how it kind of breaks through the, the 20, you know, 24 hours of, of testimony, et cetera. Tell me an example of how you've been creative, where you think you've really taken a creative approach and how did you choose to do that? And did you know it was going to work or did you kind of say, I'm going to give this a shot, but I'm sure. not sure? It, it gets back to the, what you said about meeting people where they are. Um, a few different creative approaches. I see um, Eugene Schneeberg is here. He's a faith-based director of the Department of Justice and also works on our fatherhood programming. And we kicked off this responsible fatherhood initiative, encouraging fathers to be involved in their families and reconnect with their families if they've fallen away. And one of the avenues for that that we identified was reaching out to barbers and barbershops um, because um, for the population that we were trying to reach, there was one place we knew that they were going to be every at least every two weeks, and that was two weeks, and that was the barbershop. And so we equipped barbers with information about fatherhood and connecting to fatherhood programs. It was called the Fatherhood Buzz Campaign, uh, the sound of the clippers on people's heads. Um, and, um, and it ended up being very successful. So it really is that notion of meeting people, uh, not necessarily creating new avenues, but going to the avenues that where folks are already traveling down and, and finding them where they are. Yeah. And, and if people weren't listening, they, the That's barbers. Right. Give them a little nick. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Are you listening to me? <laughs> That's right. Got it. Great. Very, very good example. Chris, let me turn to you. 
Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I, I definitely agree completely of meeting people where they are. And, and you know, for us, I think the, the creative outlet we've chosen has been, has been film, um, has been video. And, and uh, in my opinion, well, I guess I've always loved film and video. I mean, being under the age of 25, we've, you know, a lot of us have grown up with film and video as being inundated with it constantly. I think we're referred to as the what the YouTube ADD generation sometimes, uh, and that's and I think that's reflective of you know how you do need to reach millennials. I think you need to go out and find ways that makes it more appealing to us. We have so much video content to choose from uh, when there's over uh, what was it over a, a million hours of uh, of YouTube of video content is uploaded to YouTube every single day. So looking at how you're going to sort through that and how your video is going to become viral or interesting is a huge challenge. And so you know for us as an organization. You know, we really believe that by in place of if you can't go and travel there, nothing can ever replace that, or you can't go and in, into a community and meet someone or be actively participating in, in service work, uh, video is the next best thing. It can bring an emotional connection, it can take you on a journey, and it can make an issue like extreme poverty or like Syrian refugees much easier to relate to and to connect to. And it's an issue, these are issues that are so far away from our day-to-day -day lives, from away from this conference, uh, from what we're dealing with in, in, in our daily lives. And so, you know, I think for us, if you, know, if you guys want to come to check out uh, every, on our website, on our Facebook, uh, livingonone.org, every day we upload, you know, there's more content, there's the full film up there, uh, and it's really tailored to being a little bit more interesting and having it be a journey of our generation together to see what these issues are and, and how we can be a part of it. Great, and we'll come back to this topic of young people in a minute because I want to come back and talk to each of you about about that as well. But Amara, a good creativity. Sure, um, uh, you know, I, we we thought back in the day, 2003, we thought our 100 hours of testimony was pretty creative, um, and it was. It was exhausting and creative, <laughs> uh, and it actually did break through then. But what we realized a few years later was that. There, the folks here, you know, we do Hill Days every year. We bring folks to Capitol Hill. Really important to do that, and, and I, can't, um, I can't underscore that enough. Just showing up, Senator Harkin always says to me, showing up matters, and the day you don't show up is when no one on the Hill, everyone on the Hill will think no one cares. So important to show up. But the second thing is that, um, and actually relates to what you were saying, Chris, that this idea of national service being an, an experiential brand, we realized we weren't actually just breaking through enough with our Hill Day, and so what we had to do was actually get members of Congress out into the field. So we decided to do a virtual Hill Day, so instead of having everyone come to D.C., we actually um, encouraged people to do, this is the first time we did it, to do visits with their members of Congress in their local communities, in the district offices, get them out to see programs, and if they wouldn't come to see the programs, bring the folks who were serving to them. Um, the first time around that we did it, we actually didn't warn anyone. We just let everybody loose, and they all just showed up at the district offices as some members of Congress around the country. We actually hit 435 congressional districts on that one day. Um, it was pretty creative. Um, there were a number of congressional offices. <laughs> this was actually really funny in Wisconsin. Uh, there was one woman who was so freaked out by the fact that these 10 National Service people had shown up on their doorstep that she locked the door, called security, and then called all the other members of the Wisconsin delegation to say, be aware, 10 angry people are about to show up on your doorstep <laughs> to talk about National Service. Don't let them in. Um, that was actually one of our more creative <laughs> moments. Um, the next year we actually did set up appointments and warn people so that wouldn't happen again. Uh, but it did get their attention and I think, you know, trying to keep things fresh, think of new ways to engage folks, really engage them in the work that you're doing and, and the experiential piece of this I think relates to all of the stuff that you guys are talking about too. We have a saying, no story without a statistic and no st statistic without a story. And I think that's important to keep that in your brain because stats alone won't do it and stories alone won't do it. You need both. Great, great tip. Great. And I think it also reminds us that members of Congress aren't just here in Washington. They do have a home back where they, they serve. And so part of this building a movement is about how do we connect to them when they're home. And sometimes that can be the most powerful time to connect with them. And we'll, we'll be talking about that as we go. So, Josh. Oh, I think I did the creative. Oh, you did. Sorry. <laughs> no Sorry. You got to keep me in I mean, line here. Got to keep me in line. <laughs> Let's go back to the youth engagement piece. So I, you all talked a little bit about youth and how they're engaging in the work that you're doing. 
And it does seem, we have about 100 young people uh, here with us over the course of the two days, and many of them are going with us to the Hill. And it does seem to us that there is an increased desire and really engagement of young people in these kinds of social issues. Yeah. So are you seeing that? And if Absolutely. you are, how are you kind of and bringing people And it's people very in? exciting because it's, it's always sort of unexpected, um, particularly for um, elected officials and others when youth come to the table prepared and ready to advocate for the, the things that they believe in. You know, the, the expectation is that you're not going to care and your voice is not going to matter and that you're not going to take the time and the energy to, 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 to speak out in a, in, a, um, in a powerful and passionate and, and clear way with both the story and a statistic. Um, but when you do that, it really shakes people up. I, I remember one um, wonderful session that we had at the White House with a group of young people in foster care. Um, and they were talking about um, uh, growing up in foster care and then aging out um, and not having the sort of resources that they should have. Um, and uh, then layered that over the sorts of policies that they wanted to see us pursue in the White House and what they, how they wanted Congress to approach issues of young people aging out of foster care. And it was one of the most powerful meetings that I, I went to because um, they didn't need any support from the adults that were with them. In fact, the adults shut up and the kids just talked. And, um, and I think their voices were, were absolutely heard. And so blow their minds, uh, exceed expectations, and I, I do believe your voices will be heard. Chris, you're, you're obviously really appealing to this audience, um, but do you see, you know, do you see different ways to engage uh, young people in the work that you're trying to do? Yeah, and you know, I, I guess an example of again where I think uh, my friends and, and people around us really impressed us was, so I mean, we, so we finished this film um, over our remaining two years of college. You know, we weren't filmmakers, so it took us a while while studying and teachers kept giving us work while we were trying to make this movie. And, and so it took us a little while to finish it. And we, we finished right as we were graduating. Um, and we had to decide, you know, were we going to go for a more stable or traditional job or really try to run with this film and run with, with this vision. And uh, in a lot of ways, it was the people that we'd met in Guatemala, the relationships that we built, those, those real friendships that were a huge inspiration to getting us to to run with this. So we decided, okay, what do we have? What do we know is, is we have friends at colleges all over the country. Uh, we, you know, everyone has friends at all these different universities where their uh, friends from high school went to. So we decided to take a 1978 school bus. No joke, a friend gave, uh, let, let us borrow it. We took out all the seats. We put in beds, we put in desks and put solar panels on the roof and we drove it around the country for five months living in this bus, uh, driving to 25 different universities around the country. Uh, and it was really to, we put up a big map and it was people would just invite us on Facebook and if they heard about what we were doing, they would bring us to come and we'd show the film and we would in, engage around these different issues of, of global poverty. And it was incredible to see how, how people were willing to come out. I mean, we went to our first University in uh, Elon, North Carolina invited us. Uh, I'd never heard of it either if some of you uh, see some blank stares. Uh, but it's a university in, uh, in North Carolina and we turn up and you know, 10 minutes before the film's supposed to start, there are six people in the audience. Um, and inside I'm worried that this was a terrible, terrible idea to take a bus and try to drive around, around the country. And, uh, and then you know, about 10 minutes after the film was supposed to start, we had 280 people in the audience who are here to watch a film about poverty. And I think that's incredible. I think it's a testament to our generation that people, if the story is told in the right way, if it's matched to the statistics, people want to come out and be a part of it. They want to actively you know, engage with their peers on it. And it was really, you know, truly incredible for us to see that you know, that kind of engagement. And so we went around to 25 of these universities. We together raised over $65,000 directly for poverty alleviation in the community and around the world in, uh, in Guatemala where we were living. Uh, people started at 25 universities, started their own campus microfinance lending programs. We had 70 universities join an online microfinance class and all this stuff just kept building. The momentum was and it was all Facebook. I mean, we had zero marketing budget. We just had a large bus and a PA system. And it, uh, and it really worked. It was a part of, of building it. And, and, uh, but it, it is never, although it might look clean on the outside, it is never as, as simple as you think it is with all the back end side of it gets quite dirty. The bus breaks down. Uh, you know, we've crashed it once or twice. And, and, it, 
and it you know, keeps three times. <laughs> yeah, I only crashed it once, but um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Minor details that aren't relevant, but you know, and so you know, these things. It is always dirty, but you got to get back at it and just keep on trucking, right? You know. Right, and and I think again, the 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 power of kind of putting the issue into the hands of people, right? That's what got it going. The putting that out there to students, putting that out there on Facebook, so people could take it and do do things with it themselves. So Anmar, in terms of young people. Yeah, I mean, I think the democratization of this whole kind of work, um, thanks to technology and social media, has been a huge, um, a huge sort of open, new opening for us uh, as a movement. I mean, we've done the, the, I love the 1978 bus, the old technology versus the new technology. Um, that video that we showed at the, at the top of the program, um, actually I do love, my favorite part is where Senator Harkin tries to pretend like he's filming himself on his Blackberry. <laughs> We're like, yeah, that, that wouldn't work, but anyway, get him an iPhone. Um, uh, but it actually was his idea that you know we should challenge people to, if they can, come to Washington to share their stories. And so we actually put the word out to our whole field and movement to say, hey, you know, tell us why you serve. Use your iPhone, uh, create your own video. Everybody is doing it now on YouTube and, and um, certainly lots of messaging on Instagram and Facebook. And we were overwhelmed by the amount of stuff we got back from folks. I mean, that is just a very small slice of, the, um, of, of what we got in. And I think um, it, it's a real sort of new frontier. And I think, you know, members of Congress increasingly are um, following social media. We've done a couple of Twitter town halls with members of Congress in the last year that have gotten tremendous uh, pickup and tremendous buzz. And I think um, folks are using Instagram to share their stories, um, certainly Facebook. I think social media um, has, really, um, has really opened this up in a way that it's, not, it's, not, it's no longer the game of the insiders in Washington. It's really about um, connecting in a more um, real-time way. And increasingly, you know, we encourage our people, look, tweet at your members of Congress. They'll answer you. They're watching their Twitter feeds. They're watching their Facebook pages. Um, we're posting stuff on their Facebook pages where they allow us to, um, certainly sharing and following folks on Instagram. But they're all doing that now. And, and, you know, they are, even more than traditional media, they're following that stuff. So it used to be in the old days, and actually still in these days, if you call a congressional office, they literally will make a little scorecard on a piece of paper that says, how many people called about this issue? Were they for or against this issue, for or against? And now they're doing that with social media. So you can really actually have a uh, tremendous impact from your desk, from your house, from your car. Don't tweet when you're in your car, but, uh, or driving in your car, you'll crash your car like Chris did. Um, you weren't tweeting, were you? Maybe, okay. <laughs> point is, no get engaged, and, and that is a really good way to do it. If you can't be here in person or engaging your folks at home in person using social media, and, and I think that's the big, the big um, new development for young people. Great. So our audience out there is both listening virtually, so we have a virtual audience. Hopefully they're taking these messages and all of us here in the room together, too. So, Josh, let me um, turn and ask la one last question, um, and then I'll ask a, two more, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. But your work with the White House. So obviously um, this issue of they have to, people have to hear from people in the United States to know that they care about issues. What's the dynamic, particularly inside the administration in terms of hearing about issues and what's the importance of kind of social movements inside, inside the White House? You'll hear me? Okay, yeah, there, there we go. Um, People sort of know what the White House's perspective is going to be on a given issue. It's, uh, you know, obviously there's a great megaphone and um, you know, there's a tremendous power to, to set agendas, but it's, um, it's pretty expected, you know, the, where we're going to, or where the White House is going to stand on a, on a given set of issues. But when we mobilize the American people and let those voices get out there, all sorts of amazing organic things happen. You get stories that you didn't plan for. You get um, ideas that you could have never accounted for. And I, on issue after issue, every time we have a summit, whether it's on fatherhood or um, the White House bullying summit came up in a very organic way way or um, 
you know, trafficking or the other issues we, we work on, um, th that's where we uh, get the most powerful stories, not through something that we, we planned and uh, through a carefully uh, woven together White House message of, of events. So um, I, I think that's probably, uh, and, and then you have to learn to be flexible and to sort of go with it. You know, when someone shows up with a story you weren't anticipating, when, um, when the narrative goes into a different direction, um, you got to be able to run with that. I'm sure that at the hearings um, that you all had, the, you know, the all sorts of things that you weren't expecting, but um, that probably was the best source material you could you could have, and we certainly saw that in the White House as well. Yeah. So this idea of, of sometimes it's things that really are very grassroots driven, that's and, right, yeah. and I do think that's true. When you see people taking something up in a big way, you gotta you gotta just let people run just with let it. it run. That's, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Huge huge uh, experience there. So let me uh, end with one question uh, for both of you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience, and that is kind of what's the new thing? So, Ann Mara, what are you kind of looking ahead? What do you think is going to really change? Obviously, social media is really changing things now in a big way for building movements, but is there anything else that you see kind of on the horizon that you think is really going to be kind of breakthrough in yeah. terms of this kind of work? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, social media is, I would say, probably the biggest thing. But um, but the new thing is a, is actually the old thing, which is that, you know, I think there the pendulum swings constantly. I've been in Washington for a long time, and people feel like their voices are heard. They feel like they're not. They feel like they're heard. Uh, a great example. I actually did a lot of work with John Carson, um, who mm -hmm. was in the White House Office of Public Engagement when he was there. He he's since moved on. Um, and, you know, he was doing a lot of work around encouraging those of us working on these social issues to really up our game. And, in fact, um, I went in to see him and he said, well, you know what, show me what you got. Like, go do something useful and show me what you got. And, actually, we did our district day shortly thereafter and I went back in and I said, this is what we got. <laughs> we did this big thing. We engaged all these 435 congressional districts, yada, yada, and we got his attention. And he said, all right, I'm going to actually advocate for you guys inside the building because I know that you have ground troops. Um, and I think um, really thinking about the power of the collective, I think that is, it's, it's sort of both the individualized nature of social media, but it's also the power of the collective. So things like, and those of you that do a lot of um, social media know that, you know, hashtags, the power of a hashtag, everybody using the same hashtag shows the power of the collective. It's really important not only to be engaging in a one-on-one -on -one way, but also in helping people understand this isn't one community, it's not one person, it's not one small group of people. It actually matters to a lot of people around the country. And I think one of the most compelling examples of that was this, uh, not, how many of you guys have heard of nuns on the bus? The group of nuns that organized, um, my mom's two sisters are Ursuline nuns, so I love nuns. Um, but these nuns that organi organized around these issues of the, the priorities that the country was investing in and what about poverty and what about these communities really struggling. And it was really compelling and I actually went to an event that John organized and the woman who was the sort of lead nun on Nuns on the Bus, she said, look, this was like, I mean, we just got a bus like you did and we thought, you know what, we're just going to take the bus and we're going to go tell our story and more and more people, got, and Nuns on the Bus is a great name, of course, but more and more people got excited about it um, and they began to really use social media and do things in sort of old school ways and new school ways. So I, I would say that you know, what's new is what's old, which is it's about your voices individually, but it's about this collective, and it's about figuring out how to use the new technology to really share that with, with the country and with decision makers at, at really every level of government. Great. The hashtag, by the way, is hash save kids. So just pick up on the hashtag point. That's our hashtag for today. So Chris, um, last thought on kind of what, what do you see on the horizon? What's out there? Yes. And, and you've got a new film, so part of that, I assume, is what's going to happen with your new film. Yeah, so, well, let me answer on what I think the new, the new tech and platform is going to be. Because I think, you know, I, I think what's really nice is that the platform of mobile phones, even through SMS-based text messaging, is bringing people beyond the West into the, into the conversation. And I think that's, social media hasn't, the, the spread of it hasn't stopped yet. And I think this is so important that there's, you know, there are now more people in the world that have cell phones than have toilets. And it is spreading in a way that allows us to build these relationships and connections between very distinct and different worlds where uh, that wasn't possible, I mean, five years ago. And, it, and I think that's so important that we are listening actively to the people we are trying to help, um, especially as aid workers or humanitarian uh, workers. And, you know, for us, you know, in 
Guatemala, uh, we're actually Facebook friends with, with all the people from the community, and we t they text message with us, and it goes to their Facebook, and we're able to have a communication back and forth via that. And you know that alone is empowering. That alone creates change in the way where, I just want to tell you a quick anecdote of uh, one of our neighbors in the community, Rosa, was, is a 22-year-old woman who had to drop out of school when she was in fifth grade because her parents believed that her brothers were a better investment than she was, uh, so pulled her out of school um, so she could work and, and support her brothers. And now she's actually started a weaving business at, at about 20 years old and has been sending herself back through school through the profits from this weaving business. And so we obviously saw that while we were there. She's a big character uh, and friend of ours in the film. So when we came back, you know, why don't we buy the weavings from her? So it was just, it took us 30 minutes. I sent her a Facebook message, said, can we buy some of your weavings? And we now, she now sends us, uh, she's now built a full business. She has six people working for us. She sends us these fabrics. We put them on t-shirts and we sell them on our website or at events as we go around the country. And that alone, she's now, uh, you know, that combination is, is helping her to, uh, she's in November, will be graduating from, uh, from pre-med school and going on into medical school to become a nurse. And this is something that, you know, she didn't need anything from us other than an opportunity. She has every skill, every ability, every bit of intelligence that she needs and drive to make this possible. What she needed was, was just an opportunity. I think that connection of Via Mobile is making, making it happen. And, and I'll mention quickly, uh, so, you know, this uh, second film and project that we're working on was really related to to mobile phone connection in the same way, where we actually recently, uh, just a month ago, got back from living for five weeks in a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. Um, and this is our newest film and newest project. And for us, this is an issue that ourselves personally and the world, I think, has had the most difficulty to relate to, of who is a refugee, what is going on in this kind of crisis. And so we're actually really excited to have been able to partner with, with Save the Children to uh, as our impact partner on the ground. So when, we, when this film is released and when people want to make an impact, we've been able to see firsthand and show firsthand really what some of these programs are doing to connect people and empower youth and, uh, in these communities. And every single person in that refugee camp, it was this makeshift city in the middle of the desert, 100,000 people, every single one of them had at least one cell phone. So that alone will show you, you know, what it does even in terms of the communication we can create between humanitarian organizations and, and the beneficiaries we're trying to help, where SAVE was using it to send text message communications out if there was anything dangerous going on, if there was a new opportunity, if there was something people can participate in. And I think that is going to be what drives forward you know, the real conversation on, in Washington, hopefully, and, and around the world for aid organizations. Great point. And I think you know, we're seeing that a lot in our work every, every single day. I mean, if I had any doubts that cell phones kind of hadn't gotten to everywhere about a year and a half ago, I was in the Swat Valley in Pakistan, and we were working on some relief supply uh, issues there and, and giving out relief supplies and we had a text if there's problems you know on your cell phone text and I said we're out in the middle of nowhere do people really have cell phones and a woman who was in line who had a burqa full burqa on pulled her cell phone out from under her burqa and said yes and here's how you do it and I've done it and it works so it's everywhere everywhere so Totally I got, there. I got better service in the refugee camp than I do with Sprint in this room. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Josh, I think one last intervention, and then we're going to open it up to you guys. So get your questions ready. Josh. Just a quick resource for online mobilization that we use a lot. So the, the firm I started after leaving White House Values Partnerships helps foundations and nonprofits partner with the faith community to solve big challenges. And one of the uh, sites we use the most is thunderclap.it. I don't know if you're, many folks may be familiar with this, but it basically helps you coordinate your, your Twitter presence um, so that all your supporters are tweeting about the same thing at the same time, um, sometimes causing topics to trend and causing people to notice. And we've used this from movies to advocacy days and, and so forth. So again, the website is thunderclap.it and it's a very powerful resource. Yeah, yeah. great resource. So let's uh, open it up for questions from the audience and um, you can either send your question to one specific person or you can ask everybody to answer it. But um, this is a great opportunity with three people who have really been deep into the idea of building social movements. So 
you need to take advantage and ask them, ask them some questions. So who'd like to start? Have one over here? Yep. But with all this power and everything, doesn't it dilute the message at some point? I mean, there's so much out there. Doesn't it, after a while, get too much and dilute it? Great question. So I think it's kind of how do you break through and, and is there just too much noise out there? Josh? The, the answer is yes, there's absolutely a tremendous amount of noise and that raises the bar for advocacy strategies. But it also, um, it, it underscores why the work that, for example, Ann Mars is doing is so important. Because when you do something that actually is actually in person with real people, then it stands out even more. Be, um, because there's so much happening online and in social media, um, and that should that, that should happen, and your advocacy should include that that, that component. Um, but it, it really um, it, uh, it, it allows the, the the contrast for in person engagement to really stand out. And so um, you know the work that you all did. Um, in in the, all the congressional districts, that was one of the things that John Carson pointed to with other groups all the time, which was it's not ju enough to just tweet and to just post on Facebook. You actually a have to show up. So, yeah. I would also say in answer to that that it, it, it can be diluted if your message isn't clear, what you're asking for isn't clear. So you have to be incredibly clear about what is it you're after, what is it your, what's your message, what are you trying to make happen, and everybody has to be on that message. Um, and that's when the sort of volume piece is really helpful, but it is, I mean, nothing can replace the one-to-one -one personal interaction, experiential brand, all the work you guys are doing, that's an experiential brand too, so you have to do both, and I think it's really important that the sort of old ways and the new ways that you sort of keep that going. And the other point that I would make that I didn't make earlier is, Persistence, um, you know, I think a lot of people sort of will, will sort of make one run at something from an advocacy perspective. Oh, it didn't work, no one's listening, can't get it done this year. It, it's a marathon, not a sprint, for sure. And you will have ups and you will have downs and you will have wins and you will have losses, but being persistent, I think particularly over time, you begin to really build equity in, in your brand and your message and what you're doing and people will start to listen if they don't at first. Yeah, and I would just add on top of that, you know, look at yourself as well and what you find, you know, what you really find is important because each of us, each, every nonprofit or organization is going to advocate for what they want. They're going to put out their message about that issue, but what's going to make it last is going to be what you find is inspiring or what you're really passionate about. And if you're not passionate about a certain issue, maybe you can tweet about it and that'll be it and then leave it. Go to something that you're really passionate about because that's where... I believe you'll actually make more of a, an in, a, a deep impact on something. I mean, if you think about it, we're going to leave this room after this at, t at the end of the day today, and our lives are going to get super busy. We're going to go back. There's work. There's a ton of things that we're all postponing even to be here. There's a lot of stuff going on, and then it gets noisy. And so what's going to come through all that noise is only going to be the things that you actually truly believe in and that you're truly passionate about. And then... I mean, being an organization ourselves advocating for certain issues, we really want people who are going to be those brand advocates, who are going to be diehard, who are going to want to live and breathe what we're doing with us. And I think that those are going to be the most important people in a movement to really uh, – they, they provide the backbone to a movement. And then together you all try to continue to, to build and advocate and hopefully excite people about the issues that you're – that you really care about, but again, I think uh, you know, look inside to what really pushes you as a as a person. Yeah, and we talked a lot about that yesterday. How you bring those stories to life when we're up on the hill today? Why, you know, the the question that members will have is, why are you here? Why are you here talking about Save the Children? Why do, why do you care about these issues? And that's really important. And the ask is really important. We'll talk a little bit about the ask as we get into our groups uh, today because you do have to be really clear. What do you want people to do? And what are you trying to get them to actually do? Great. So other questions from the audience? Yep, got one right here in the middle. You got a um, mic right behind you. Thank you. I'm a classroom educator, and one of the things to make it more personal, um, do y'all uh, participate in vlogs and Skyping classroom to classroom, you know, Skyping sort of sessions where students in um, 
more fluent communities can see how the other half, I mean, that kind of gains a following. They can become more involved. They can see exactly what's going on. Just a thought. So you're talking about connecting beneficiaries, the, the people who are in programs like Save the Children does with other communities. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, you know, we made great use of um, Google Hangouts in the White House um, to get groups of people together in conversations and um, and to bring real stories. Um, uh, e e emails are great, uh, Twitter's great, but again, the power of video is, is essential. So I would just agree with you, it's a, it's a uh, absolutely essential tool. Yeah, we also use a lot of, we've seen Google Hangout to be hugely successful. We actually, with Save, did a, uh, a Google Hangout live from inside of the refugee camp while we were living there. And again, it's amazing that there was enough internet connectivity inside of a refugee camp to be able to live stream out to you know, tons of high school classrooms and university classrooms all over the US and around the world, actually. And I think you know, we gotta continue to push those boundaries of what we can do. Um, and then I think, I think the video blog side is, is huge as well. And something that we really saw when we started showing this full film and people, teachers really enjoyed it and loved, wanted to use it in their classrooms, um, but they wanted even more. And so what we decided to do was, when we filmed in Guatemala, we filmed 260 hours of footage. Uh, so we have a ton of stuff. The film is only an hour long. So we took the remaining footage and we just started piecing it into short episodes on different issues to do with extreme poverty. So we have an episode on clean water, an episode on uh, nutrition, on education, on employment, financial lives, and, and allowing teachers to really delve deep into a specific issue. And then it brings up the critical questions that, that we should be asking ourselves about. It doesn't even necessarily provide you answers, but it allows for discussion, it allows for the promotion of what our generation is gonna do to, to be a part of it. And I think we wanna continue to push ourselves on how we on how we continue to create that kind of content for schools in a relatable way, in a way that is, allows you to immediately take action and in a way that respects the dignity of the people that we're showing on film. And that will always be something that we hold true and that we will continue to you know, speak with Rosa on Facebook and we'll continue to uh, be in contact with our friends in the refugee camp and bring them into the conversation because their voice is even more powerful than ours. I wish Rosa or one of the others could be up here talking right now. And when we actually, we went down to Guatemala to show them the film before we showed it to anyone else and allowed them to sign off, see how they were being shown on camera. And then we actually did a, a mini uh, premiere with it in a, in a local town. And instead of us going up to speak afterwards, you know, Rosa got up to talk about her own life and to speaking to a group of 300 of her peers of university students in Guatemala about you know, to, to never give up fighting, to never stop pursuing your passion. And I think, you know, why not? Why not keep trying to push those boundaries? Why not try to bring Rosa more into the equation? And, and I think that's something that as humanitarian organizations, we should continue to be pushing ourselves on. Great point. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. If there's one more question in the audience. No, we have time for no more questions. I'm getting the no. <laughs> All right, I think we're done. Let's give a big hand to our panel. I think they were fantastic. Thank you. To a great branding strategy uh, in order to name the firm. Um, I work with Mark and the team at uh, Save the Children and we've been working with you guys for about a year now in uh, standing up a new 501c4 uh, that'll help you put a little bit of skill and a little bit of muscle and a little bit of oomph behind